Today we are happy to present Tule McNelly as an industry veteran with over 15 years in the game industry and with big names like Sega, Bioware, DICE and EA. Tule brings experience and knowledge into every conversation and strives to create a more inclusive and diverse game industry. Welcome Tule, so nice to have you with us. Nice to meet you everyone. So today's topic is diversity in gaming and why it matters. Today, um, we'll go over a few basic principles, such as how we can be more appealing to a diverse audience. Um, but most importantly, we'll be talking about why any of this matters is, and why it's important. And I hope by the end of the session, um, we will have inspired and empowered everyone to think more critically about inclusivity in the games you create and play. Um, and I'm looking forward to having those discussions with you in the Q&A as well. So before we dive into um, the meaty part and the data and all the fun things and examples, um, I want to say a few, qu few quick words uh, to introduce who I am and what I do. Um, as you can see from my name and maybe from my accent, um, you may not <laughs> know where to place me. So uh, again, my name is Tulay um, Tetiga McNally. Uh, I was born to Turkish parents uh, in Munich uh, and I was raised in Munich, uh, studied American cultural history and psychology at the University of Munich before I started my first career as a journalist specializing in post-production and CGI. About 15 years ago, I decided to make a complete career switch and um, into gaming and pack my bags, move to Montreal to work in uh, localization and localization testing, uh, mostly for games like... Um, Konami and Ubisoft. Uh, then I moved back to Europe to work in London um, for Square Enix and for Sega um, before I made the big jump across the ocean again um, and moved to Bioware in Edmonton. There I spent about eight years uh, heading up central development operations which included uh, QA, QA technology and publishing services and I worked on games like uh, Dragon Age 2, Dragon Age Inquisition, Mass Effect 3, uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, and I left a year before we shipped uh, Anthem. Now, almost four years ago, I moved to Stockholm for personal reasons. Uh, I worked at DICE as a senior development director on the studio operations side. Um, and about a bit over a year ago, <clears throat> I took on a job um, on a global EA-wide level, uh, heading up inclusive design for electronic arts. And in this role, I'm working um, in an also brand new um, group within EA called Positive Play. And that team specifically is working to create um, or work with developers to create the right environments for our players, focusing on safe and fair play to enable authentic inclusion in our games and services, because both go hand in hand, essentially. However, today's talk is more of a generic nature and not focused on anything specifically we do at EA, so just wanted to um, say that as a disclaimer. Um, now, I want to start by going over what we actually mean when we talk about inclusion and diversity, especially in the context of game design. An image I like to use in order to explain um, what that is, is um, this image of uh, an iceberg. In our normal day to day, we mostly see diversity through what we see with our own eyes, um, and which is usually superficial traits that people can see, um, which are above the waterline. So behavioral psychologists and social scientists use this image of the diversity iceberg to demonstrate the problem where visible traits like race, gender, and other, other physical um, attributes sit at the top of the waterline with a larger portion of non-visible characteristics lurking below, which really emphasize that sense of belonging um, and, and bring about that sense of belonging, um, whether that's at work or in our product. Really the key point of this image of the iceberg is that the core of who we are, our identity is made up of the dimensions that mostly exist below the surface. They are buried qualities that are critical to our individuality and provide the actual essence of diversity. That's an important fact to remember as we think about the games we make. There's a lot of research out there, which I will uh, go more into detail on the next slides, um, that show players want more of that diversity. They want to be seen, 
They want to be acknowledged by us as makers and shapers of culture. And they want to see that through authentic and believable characters and stories and worlds. And by that, I mean characters and, and stories that do not fall into the typical stereotypes and tropes. For creative conflict to drive innovation, we need thinking partners that are different to us. So we need those people with different backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds and experiences so we can think together uh, and think in new dimensions without having our blinders on. And the best approach, especially in our creative industry, is to stay open-minded and staying curious and showing considerations to other cultures, other norms and constraints, and by being mindful of our own expectations, which are influenced by our own cultural background and contexts. And as many of you know, there are many different types of biases, starting with thinking biases, such as confirmation biases or behavioral biases, such as optimism or overconfidence. And I'm saying this because when or if you ever go through trainings about unconscious bias, that's probably one of the most important trainings um, we have done, at least in our company, um, that make people just more sensitive and aware that um, their opinion and what they think doesn't represent the world. So we need to connect with different people and we need to be aware that we have our biases in order to make games that will connect with the world. Those biases can lead us to overlook important things and risks, especially when we believe we are dealing with a familiar situation. It's also easier to see biases in other people than in yourself. So which means when we work on improving our own awareness and skills, we need to be open-minded for feedback, we need to be humble. And in our context, this means we need to bring other people um, in to listen to them. Um, so we are not just like, um, you know, surrounding ourselves with people who are the same as us, but people who are different to us. Some questions you can ask yourself, for example, um, to discover whether you have those biases is, how um, and what do we do to be more inclusive? How do we deal with different opinions? Um, how do we invite um, different opinions? Whose perspectives are we missing? Um, who is not at the table who we should be listening to? Um, how can we encourage um, the questions uh, to go from here? Now about some uh, typical stereotypes and tropes. Um, in and yes, I put Mario in here, but I'll explain to you later. In <laughs> um, most of the successful video game titles, it's um, not uncommon to see women characters to have stereotypical female traits, like here in Mario, um, which um, kind of shows that being submissive is typically uh, um, portrayed in games or waiting to be rescued or controlled by men. Um, while male characters are oftentimes portrayed as they are strong, powerful, muscular knights, um, and the female ones in games are often like the damsel in distress, sure, shown uh, to have um, barely any power. It's uh, happening less, um, but if you play older games or even watch movies, that's quite um, um, present. In many games, women are also shown as support characters. Um, they are in the background. They are not playable characters. They're weak or in distress, uh, in need of rescue. Um, black men are often shown as hyper-masculine and aggressive, um, and they are being talked about in their physical traits, uh, which may lead some people to think that all men are like this. So the problem here really is that games, such as movies and other media, are a source of information for many, especially for younger children. It really informs their version of what they think reality is, which is likely not the reflection of how reality actually is. It's a source of information for many, um, but this false and inaccurate information can shape a person's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors towards those ethnic minor minorities, for example. And we risk uh, or we face a risk that these stereotypes may lead people to believe they are real. This is what I mean when I appeal to our social responsibility as shapers of culture. We need to be aware not to feed into these stereotypes as they can be dangerous. So when, it came, when it comes to then developing games, 
and you look around in the studios you work or even um, maybe with your fellow students if you're at a university, while males are still the majority culture, especially in leadership positions, especially in creative leadership positions. And when they tell a story of a minority culture without giving them an opportunity to express themselves as part of the creative process, we really can run a risk to create a misleading and maybe even dangerous stereotype, as I mentioned. So with character design, we need to look at things like the visual aspect, like clothing, hair, or hair texture, tattoos, makeup, different skin types, skin conditions, personalities, their background story, and the character's abilities as well. So talking to your players, ideally when you have that personal connection, if you go to a convention, for example, or you have maybe a focus test, really can be the best source of that inspiration. And we also know that diverse teams lead to more creativity and innovation through empathy with our players. It's harder to build products for everyone if we are not in the right environment where inclusion is fostered. And this is how inclusion at the workplace and inclusion in the product are linked. To achieve that balance, cultural exchange between the minority and the majority culture, cultures, and by that I mean like our players and our creators, for example, as well, there are a few things we can do. And for example, we can hire more diverse talent. Um, we can encourage more diverse people to go to universities to graduate and then take on senior creative uh, leadership positions and really um, mentor uh, and support them when they are in the workplace and really bolster um, that um, culture if you don't have it in your, in your creative leadership by creating your employee networks um, which I will um, talk a bit more um, later on and maybe also in the Q&A. Some uh, positive examples uh, on the other side. So um, what are some of these positive examples uh, and where are we ahead of them? In the end, it's really all about giving players options. Um, as an industry, we have been recently making some really great forward strides. Um, if we recall the image of the iceberg again that I showed earlier, um, on this slide are some really great examples of inclusive design, um, positive um, or well done. Um, Last of Us 2 sets a new standard for accessibility. The images here on the page are all examples um, that are also often overlooked uh, as themes. One of the images you see here is of Falk, um, because I also worked with the Battlefield team, both on um, Battlefield 5, um, the Pacific expansion, and the recent game uh, 2042. And um, it's nice to see, I mean, I'm, I'm now, I guess, uh, considered an older woman, I'm not going to disclose my age, um, but it's nice to see as an older gamer to see also um, characters that are maybe around my age, uh, maybe a bit older. So it's kind of diversity in age ranges as well, um, which is, um, I, I really applaud um, DICE for kind of trying to think um, in, in very different creative ways to include more diversity in the operator roster, for example. Um, another great example of a game that I personally played exhaustively is uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey where you have both um, really good um, LGBTQ plus res representation, um, but you also had a strong leading female playable character you could choose from, which is also not often um, the case. Hellblade uh, did a really fantastic job with mental health representation. Um, in the game, if you don't know it, um, it's a short game, so I recommend you picking it up. Um, in the game, the main character is called Sinua, uh, and she experiences frequent hallucinations and delusions during her journey, which are all symptoms of psychosis. And the game teams worked with um, psychologists to really make sure that it's uh, respectfully and authentically done. And you can really feel that throughout um, the, the game. Um, the last example that I've also listed here <clears throat> is another game I've contributed to, which is uh, The Sims 4 <clears throat> Moroccan Courtyard um, DLC. In this case, specifically, we worked with uh, people who are either from Morocco or are cultural experts uh, and consultants in this area to talk to us about the look and the feel of the furniture, the atmosphere, um, the outfits they are wearing, um, the family unit and how that's represented to make sure it's as believable and authentic as possible. 
also when we look at the different genres, um, some genres do better than others and RPGs um, just by nature offer more choice, um, but still often the default characters are still male and white. Though I want to say especially over the last two or three years, gender representation um, and that of different ethnicities has really quite improved. And when it comes to disability representation, we are lacking a bit behind them. In disability representation, physical disabilities are still most often portrayed in games. And by that, I mean things like uh, amputees, burn victims, victims of ballistic trauma, wheelchair-bound characters, and more. So for developers, these are the disabilities they are most likely to tackle. And more nuanced uh, issues like anxiety, depression, uh, are far less um, um, tackled. In summary, um, to close off this section, as a developer, it's a very powerful experience when you uh, connect and feel connected to your players. Uh, with more representation, our players can develop a much stronger sense of community and feel connected to your brand. And we need to explore more of these diverse ideas and stories and bring the people more in to play our games and not just shut them out um, because we have put in systems or structures in place to enable this. So it's our social responsibility as developers. So then um, if you want to make um, the case or if you need to convince someone, it's usually best done if you have some data. So how do players react to these inclusion efforts? Um, there's a data platform called NewZoo, uh, which has run a study about a year ago with gamers from the UK and the US. Uh, and the results between uh, both territories were quite similar. The key results in summary were that players want to see more diverse characters uh, in games that feel like they are meant for them. In the end, you are not making a game for yourself, uh, especially if you are working uh, as part in a larger studio. Um, and we really shouldn't be only thinking about the players we have today, but also about the players that are out there that we're not even reaching with our games because of a variety of things such as your game is not culturalized or not localized for a certain territory. Women, for example, still play more on mobile than on console, but they also play more on console than on PC. So opening up your game to different platforms can open up new opportunities to reach different uh, and new players. And these are just a few examples, and we can maybe talk a bit more in the Q&A. Now, let's uh, dig deeper into data, and I'll pour myself a coffee real quick, um, <laughs> because my throat is hurting. Um, players, as you can see on this uh, summary slides, again, um, this is focused on the US, US, but the numbers for the UK are fairly similar. Um, but in conclusion, it's clear that players find diversity so important that 54% responded with yes, and particularly gamers of the LGBTQ plus community. And those who identify as transgender, non-binary, uh, or have a disability with almost two thirds indicating um, diversity is important to them in gaming. Irrespective of race, gender, identity, disability status, or sexual orientation, almost half of the gamers have said they didn't play a certain game because they felt like it wasn't made for them. And a hot topic uh, at the moment, um, especially if you're making RPGs are character creators, in the study also, 35% of players stated that they were creating characters that looked like themselves. All the physically att attributes uh, is regarded as a number one aspect. Various groups differ slightly in their perceived importance of those aspects. For example, a higher share of gamers of ethnic minorities find being able to customize ethnicity and race is important compared to Caucasian gamers. A similar pattern is observed when it comes to women uh, and gender, as well as gamers with disability and character customization of disabilities. Gamers of ethnic minorities are also more likely to have an opinion on the representation of uh, racial and ethnic identities in game characters. So in terms of perceived improvements of representation, this is similar across most ethnic minority groups. However, the share is the lowest still with approximately 40% finding improvement and representation when it comes to racial and ethnic identities. Um, so we are going forward at least, which is good. 
Um, on this slide, I wanted to share this because there are some um, um, important, I mean, just as I said earlier, the best you can do is really connecting to your players. So I wanted to share some of the quotes from people who were surveyed um, to um, give you some samples of why this matters to our players. To conclude this section, 46% um, of gamers in the US indicate that they are able or they want to play games from publishers that also take an active stance on societal issues. This is irrespective of race, gender, identity, disability, sexual orientation. In comparison, for 56% of UK gamers, particularly to gamers of ethnic minorities, find it important that developers or publishers take a stance um, to societal issues. With 40% of gamers indicating that they are able to play games from publishers that take an active stance um, on this. It's stronger among ethnic minorities compared to Caucasian gamers, but it's still a strong number. So what do we mean by um, social or societal issues? There can be anything related to um, environment, for example, how companies are dealing with a carbon footprint. It can be uh, in-game donations or charitable events uh, and other things. So more companies are doing this because um, especially with um, the younger generations, um, they care about these social causes. So if they can connect it with the hobby and what they love, um, the, the better. So to close this talk off, um, I really want to finish this off with what really um, builds a core foundation to enable uh, all of this. And that's really uh, ourselves. At the beginning, we talked a bit about the um, diversity iceberg, where we talked about being more self-aware of our own biases, but um, leadership um, and inclusive design context is just as important. Being aware of your own bias and moving to celebrating all the nuances of diversity that are contained within a certain culture or a person can help create an environment of respect, acceptance, and ultimately what we call a sense of belonging. And by hiring more staff from culturally diverse backgrounds and teams and companies can become more agile, innovative, and creative because great ideas can come from anywhere. And fact is that we create games for a global audience with different experiences and different cultural backgrounds. And the same goes for the development partners we may be interacting with around the globe to make those games or support service or technology. So being self-aware and believing in the value of diversity and inclusion as a leader helps you establish a respectful and welcoming team culture. And if we are all open, accepting and embracing uh, of each other, we inevitably become more tolerant, compassionate and patient. Relationships develop more deeply and quickly. People feel more valued. You have psychological safety, um, which means you can innovate um, and your engagement in your teams also increase. And it may sound too good to be true, but I have indeed seen it work in studios like Bioware, where humility was one of our core values. And as an anecdote, the games where there was strong camaraderie, um, psychological safety, um, and support where the games were um, ironically uh, had the highest Metacritic uh, uh, um, that I worked on. Um, and I mean, Inquisition, Dragon Age Inquisition and Mass Effect 3 were some of them. Now to bring this full, um, back, uh, full circle back to the diversity iceberg I talked about at the beginning, having this knowledge and surrounding yourself with a diverse workforce can cover your blind spots. Uh, a blind spot represents either a lack of diversity awareness, maybe prejudices or inaccurate um, per preconceived notions about people. Blind spots inevitably lead to misunderstandings and conflict also in your games. They also create biases in the workplace, practices, uh, and they can really um, stifle creativity. It really takes a lot of effort and character to see beyond our own box uh, and respectfully embrace people who are different to us. 
And this brings us back also to the definition of inclusive design, which is ultimately about engaging with people who can be completely different to you. Inclusive design is about designing for um, an as diverse range of people as possible. It's essentially a philosophy that encourages us to consider how gender, age, sexuality, ethnicity, socioeconomic backgrounds, culture and customs, different body shapes and sizes, language, um, accents, religious beliefs, etc., shape the way we interact with the world. And most importantly, it's about building products and services in the light of this understanding. All of this encourages us to consider cultural, societal, social, and other needs um, and extending past those to the perceived um, average or typical. Inclusive design is also about engaging authentically with the diverse people who are your core audience, your players, by helping us understand their complex intersectional needs. The outcomes uh, following an inclusive design process, including reaching more of your current market, opening up new and future markets, and reducing the risk of alienating potential uh, markets and players um, is the future. And with that, um, I thank you very much for um, staying with me and listening to my talk. And uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A.